our text today, we're in John chapter 10, and he's going to bring up a metaphor of the shepherd. He's going to talk about the shepherd and his sheep and the flock and a gate and a pen and all of these things. And we're going to dig into that here in a moment. But this chapter 10, at the beginning of chapter 10, you might look in your Bible and you notice that there is no commentary about a location or a time in which this particular metaphor was given. That's because chapter 10 is closely connected to what happened in chapter 9. And if you look in chapter 9, you will see Jesus, and he healed a blind man, and then that blind man went to the Pharisees, and you had this fight between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, the first thing I want you to write from this text, before we ever dig into it, the first thing that I want you to write down, the the first idea is this, you are going to follow somebody. There is no option of not following something. You are going to follow somebody. In this particular case, in John chapter 10, uh, he gives this teaching in the context of, you can either follow me, who has just healed a blind man, or you can follow the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders of the day. Now, in this context, what we see here is that Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. It didn't fit in their box. And so instead of the Pharisees changing to follow Jesus, they said, no, we want Jesus to change to follow us. That ain't going to work, is it, folks? And so we are seeing this these, this dichotomy here, these two folks of you can either follow Jesus or follow it. Now, the word shepherd and the idea of shepherd, that metaphor was used in the Old Testament. That metaphor was used to refer to the leaders of the people of Israel. And in particular, it talked about God's leaders. So the leaders that represented God, these would be uh, the kings. The kings were talked about as shepherds. This would have been the prophets and the other spiritual leaders. They, these were all referred to as, as shepherds. And so when, when you have this idea of leadership among the people of God, he is referring to them as shepherds. Uh, let me pull up a couple of verses for you in Ezekiel that talks about these shepherds. So follow along as I, I read Ezekiel 34, I believe. And listen to what Ezekiel prophesies about shepherds in Ezekiel 34 and verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and wear the wool and butcher the fattened animals, but you do not tend the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays, or sought the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for all the wild animals when they were scattered. My flock went away on all the mountains and every high hill. My flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and there was no one searching or seeking for them. Then in Ezekiel 34, 23, I will establish over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will shepherd them. He will tend them himself and will be their shepherd. Now Ezekiel was written hundreds of years after David lived. How could he raise up a shepherd named David to shepherd his flock? Any ideas? A descendant of David, and his name is? Jesus. Now we'll get to the good shepherd next week, but for right now, we're talking about this idea, this metaphor of shepherds, and the reality that you're going to follow someone, and you've got good shepherds, and you've got not so good shepherds. Now let's look in the text, and we're going to dig into it now. You're going to follow somebody, but number two, you might follow the wrong somebody. You might follow the wrong somebody. Notice what he says in chapter 10 and verse 1. Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, and the gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. 
He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Now, we have here a metaphor, and uh, this metaphor that he gives, this illustration that he gives, the, the disciples listening to him would have understood it. Now, you and I, we're, we're not shepherds. Some of you might be a shepherd, I don't know, but you're definitely not a shepherd in the Middle East. I know that for a fact. And so how did this work? Well, he's given this metaphor uh, in the context of what they would do when they would bring the flocks of sheep home. Uh, you have these Bedouins. These are uh, people that would travel. They would uh, live in tents. And depending upon the time of year, they would travel to find where the water sources and the food sources and the protection would be. And they would pick up tent and they would literally move an entire city to another location so that they could take care of their sheep. And you had multiple shepherds and multiple flocks of sheep owned by different people in that community. And at night, they would bring the sheep home during certain parts of the year. They would bring them home to a large communal sheep pen that they had built. And there was one gate into this sheep pen. And at night, all of the sheep would go in to that sheep pen. And so he is talking about that scenario that they would have been very accustomed to. Now what he does here is he points out that there are some shepherds who are illegitimate shepherds. He talked about them coming in, they are thieves and they are robbers. But there are other shepherds that are legitimate. And so in this scenario he points out some of the attributes of the legitimate shepherd. Look, look back in the text. First of all, he's authorized. In verse 3, it says, The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. There was a gatekeeper, one of the shepherds or an under-shepherd, a member of that community, that would be stationed at the gate all night long, and the people would come, and the only way to get in and out was through the gate, and the only way to have access to the sheep that were inside the sheep pen was if the gatekeeper let you in. Now, he did not let you in if you were not one of the shepherds whose sheep was in the pen. If I didn't have sheep in there and I walk up and said, hey, I'd like to get in there, he'd say, nope, you ain't got no sheep in there, you're not going in. He had to be authorized in order to get in the pen. But not only that, he had to be recognized. Look at what the Bible says. It says, and the sheep hear his voice he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And we see that the shepherd would come. And you had all of these sheep in there. And if you had one common call for all of the sheep, guess what would happen? They would all come out of the sheep pen. But you don't want all of them coming out of the sheep pen. All you want is your specific flock coming out of that pen. And you want the rest of them to stay. And so, in the ancient Near East and in the Near East today, you have shepherds. They would speak to their sheep, and the sheep recognize the voice of their specific shepherd. This says he called them by name. Shepherds, even today, have names for every one of their sheep, either a name or a specific whistle or a specific call, uh, because you might be out on the side of a hill, and you got a sheep going a little bit awry, and if you say, hey, get over here, or you say, come see. The entire flock would come. So they had to have individual calls so that you could give instructions from distance to a specific sheep out there. And so it was very personalized. They recognized, they knew the shepherd intimately. And so how do we know if that's the true shepherd? When he spoke, his sheep left. And we knew that he was a true shepherd because they were leaving. But not only did we see he was authorized, not only did we see he was recognized, but he mobilized. Look at the next bit. It says there that the sheep follow him because when he has brought out his own, he goes ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Uh, some context, the shepherd will use dogs. Some context, the shepherd will drive sheep. But in this Middle Eastern context, the shepherds would lead the sheep. 
the shepherd would go and the sheep would follow. You see, the legitimate shepherd is the one that the sheep would follow. And so he would go and say, man, I know where the grass is. I know where the water is. I know where the protection is. And they would follow him as he led. So we see the authorization. uh, We we see the recognition. We see the mobilization. But then notice the flip side of that, what it says about the false shepherds. It says there in verse 5, they will never follow a stranger. Instead, they'll run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. They don't have the authorization. Uh, They can't go through the gate. They got to go over the side of the fence. You saw that before. Not only that, they don't recognize he's not, there's no recognition. They don't recognize his voice. If I were to go up to those sheep and say, come here, sheep, come here, sheep, they would never come to me. I don't know their names. I don't know the whistle. I don't know the right call. They don't recognize me. They won't come to me. And then on top of that, if I say, hey, sheep, y'all follow me, and I go walk in one direction, what will the sheep do? Not that, okay? Fact, it says they will run the other direction when a stranger begins to speak to them. And so what we see here is we see that there is a legitimate right person to follow and a wrong person to follow, no doubt about it. And the wrong person to follow, Jesus said in verse 1, they are thieves and they are robbers. The word thief means someone who steals but they do it in a sly way. The robber is one who steals, but uses violence to do so. And so you've got these thieves. They're coming to steal the sheep. They are the false shepherds because they are in it for themselves, whereas the true shepherd is in it to minister to the sheep. Did you hear the the description of the bad shepherds in Ezekiel? They take the wool and the food and all of that, but they don't tend the sheep. So we see that there is a danger there. You might be following the wrong somebody. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15. Are you ready? It says, be on your guard against false prophets, shepherds, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Church family, please listen to me. Not everybody who calls himself a preacher is worth worth listening to. Not every preacher on YouTube and every teacher on YouTube is worth listening to. I feel like in our Christian culture today that if it's on YouTube, we think it must be true. And our people will spend so many hours studying the Bible via a YouTube preacher. They, They swear by these guys. Listen. Not everybody on the internet's worth listening to. It could be that you got a wolf in sheep's clothing there. Now, we become so naive. We can be so trusting. And we can say, oh, but he's so good, and people are following him, and and everything is great. Let's listen to this shepherd. Let's listen to this leader. And we go in hook, line, and sinker, and we are so naive It could be that you're about to be robbed. It could be you're following the wrong somebody. So let me give you the third thing. How to follow the right somebody. Would you like to know that? How to fo- I don't want to follow the thief. I want to follow the right shepherd. How to follow the right somebody. So these disciples in verse 6... It says, Jesus gave them this figure of speech, this parable, but they did not understand what he was telling them. I'll be honest with you, I don't feel so bad about me not understanding what Jesus said on some stuff. Amen? If the disciples walking with him didn't quite get it, I I don't have a problem not quite getting it. Who is the shepherd? Who is the sheep? Who are the pen? He doesn't tell us exactly, but what he does is he uses that metaphor, and he's about to build off of it to teach us some things. And so the first thing he begins to teach us and found in verse 7, Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am not the shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. And then again in verse 9, he says, I am the gate. So in repeating that he is the gate, he's going to give us two main thoughts about Jesus as the gate. Now, 
in this particular context, it's still shepherding and sheep, but we've moved away from the pen back at the Bedouin camp, and we have now moved out into the wilderness. Because there were days in which they were so far away from the camp in order to find food and water that they were not able to travel back to camp at nighttime. There is a point in the season where they have to really get far away from the camp. And so on our trip to Israel this last week, we went to what's known as the shepherd fields. And we looked at some of these fields, and it's very mountainous. The sheep are on the side of mountains, but in those mountains there are caves. So at nighttime, instead of putting the sheep in a pen, they would put them in a cave, but the cave doesn't have any built doors or gates on it. So how do we protect the mouth of the cave? The shepherds would lie down and sleep at the mouth of the cave. And literally, the shepherd would become the gate to the cave. We went down in some of those caves. They were pretty extensive. And you, you can see where they would have had their sheep and where they would have lied, uh, lain down and where they would have protected it. You heard the phrase, over my dead body? This is the context from which that came. So the shepherd was lying there and said, nothing is getting in unless it gets past me, and nothing's coming out unless it gets past me. And so you have this shepherd, Jesus, serving as the gate. Now he says two things uh, right here about being the gate. First of all, he talks about access. Look what he says. He says, truly, truly, I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. He was the one that gave authority to who got in there. Who was it that determines the right shepherd or the right ones to follow? It is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that says, yep, they're authorized. You follow them. Nothing else. Uh, he says, everyone that went before me. Uh, does that mean that Moses isn't a shepherd? Does that mean that Joshua wasn't? Does that mean David wasn't? No, 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 no. He's not saying that. What he's saying is anybody that got in here without coming through me is a false shepherd and a false teacher. What does that say about the Pharisees that rejected the gate? They were false. They were false. So it comes through Jesus Christ. We see this authority, and then we see this access. Again, look what it says. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in, and then he'll go out, and he'll find pasture. If someone comes through the gate, that means that they are a sheep legitimately in that fold, in that flock, going into that cave. That cave provided prof protection. It provided salvation and deliverance. If they entered by the gate of Jesus, that's the ones that would be saved from the thieves. But who was it? How did they get out of that cave? Because there's no food in the cave, right? There ain't no water in the cave. You can't just sit in the cave. The sheep had to get out of the cave at some point. If the sheep came out of the cave in a different way other than by the gate, what did that mean? What'd that mean, guys? If the sheep got out some other way than the gate, that meant that a thief and a robber had gotten in there and pulled them out. Are y'all tracking with me? You eyes are open, but you may not be awake today, huh? So what he's saying is, if you come out, that means there's a legitimate shepherd that is bringing you out, and where is that legitimate shepherd taking you? Food and water. Notice what it says. You'll be saved and come in, and then you'll go out and find pasture. You see, those who enter by the gate of Jesus Christ, this word, be saved, it does have a very practical meaning of being delivered and being protected, but it also has a very spiritual meaning of being saved from sin and from hell. Later in the book of John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. The only way to have salvation is to go through the gate of Jesus Christ. But not only that, 
the only way to live a fulfilled life on this planet is to do so as you follow Jesus Christ. Notice, it says there, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. God is not a cosmic killjoy. What he is, is the one who will let you live how you were designed to live. You see, when we have this choice, many times we make the decision based on the today. I don't want to give up this sin. I don't want to give up authority of my life. I don't want to surrender to Jesus. But we're so short-sighted, we forget that the gate is wide and the path is wide that leads to destruction. But the gate is narrow and the path is narrow that leads to life. You see, it looks great. We choose to follow that thing. But the reality is, the end result is that we are stolen we are killed, and we are destroyed. Well, who, who are these shepherds? Jesus approved. Give Jesus access. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. I want you to listen to this. It says there, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You see, at our church, we have a God-called shepherd. At our church, we have a church-affirmed shepherd. Nobody appointed the shepherd at this church. God called him, the church voted, and affirmed that call. There is an under-shepherd of this church who is responsible for the souls of the flock of God known as First Baptist Church Lafayette. He is responsible to feed them God's Word. He is responsible to lead them to water. He is responsible to go find them when they get astray. He is responsible to mend their wounds. He is responsible and answers to the under-shepherd or answers to the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Do you know who the under-shepherd is at First Baptist Church of Lafayette? Aren't you glad that God called such a good-looking under-shepherd for you? And humble as well. <laughs> no YouTube preacher is responsible for your soul in the same way that I am. No book writer is responsible for your soul the way that I am. When God looks at me, he's going to say, all right, Pritchard, I entrusted my flock to you. Did you do it? Did you fill the pulpit? Did you lead them? Did you serve them? Did you love them well? And I'm going to say, I don't know. I trusted you and did the best I could.
Now we have choices. I have a choice on whom I follow. In the event that I stop following Jesus, I fail to be his under shepherd. In the event that I stop pointing you to Jesus, I fail to be the under shepherd. If I begin to take advantage of you for my own personal gain, I fail to be the under shepherd. Let me give you another under shepherd that God has given you. Some of you may not have thought of this one. Fathers are the under shepherd of their family. Dads, you are to shepherd your family to look to Jesus. You are responsible for feeding them God's word. You are responsible for protecting them against the wolves of this world. You are responsible to point them to Jesus Christ. And one day you will be held accountable for how you shepherded your family. But we are all sheep, including me, in this flock of God. And while the shepherds in our life are responsible to lead, the sheep are responsible to follow. And we choose every day who we follow. We can follow the under-shepherds of Christ and in doing so follow Christ. Or we can follow a whole host of other things in our life. And I've laid before you the end result of whom you choose to follow. And you need to follow wisely. Would you like someone to pray with you about a need in your life? Or perhaps you'd like to join us in praying for needs in our community and around the world. We have a prayer page on our website at fbclaf.org. There you can submit prayer requests, and you can also pray for the request of others. Visit our prayer page at fbclaf.org. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist Lafayette, visit our website at fbclaf.org.